from the prophecies and revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden. At the end, a prayer for the intercession of St. Bridget of Sweden. Rejoice eternally, O blessed body of God, in perpetual honor and in perennial victory and in your everlasting omnipotence together with your Father and the Holy Spirit and also with your blessed and most worthy Mother and with all your glorious heavenly court. To you be praise indeed, O eternal God, and endless thanksgiving for the fact that you deigned to become a human being and that for us in the world you willed to consecrate your venerable body out of material bread and lovingly bestowed it on us as food for the salvation of our souls. It happened that a person who was absorbed in prayer heard then a voice saying to her, O you to whom it has been given to hear and see spiritually, hear now the things that I want to reveal to you, namely, concerning that archbishop who said that if he were pope, he would give leave for all clerics and priests to contract marriages in the flesh. He thought and believed that this would be more acceptable to God than that clerics should live dissolutely, as they now do. For he believed that through such marriage the greater carnal sins might be avoided. And even though he did not rightly understand God's will in this matter, nonetheless that same archbishop was still a friend of God. But now I shall tell you God's will in this matter, for I gave birth to God himself. You will make these things known to my bishop and say to him that circumcision was given to Abraham long before the law was given to Moses and that, in that time of Abraham, all human beings whatsoever were guided according to their own intellect and according to the choice of their own will and that, nevertheless, many of them were then friends of God. But after the law was given to Moses, it then pleased God more that human beings should live under the law and according to the law rather than follow their own human understanding and choice. It was the same with my son's blessed body. For after he instituted in the world this new sacrament of the Eucharist and ascended into heaven, the ancient law was then still kept, namely, that Christian priests lived in carnal matrimony. And nonetheless, many of them were still friends of God because they believed with simple purity that this was pleasing to God, namely, that Christian priests should have wives and live in wedlock just as, in the ancient times of the Jews, this had pleased him in the case of Jewish priests. And so, this was the observance of Christian priests for many years. But that observance and ancient custom seemed very abominable and hateful to all the heavenly court and to me, who gave birth to his body, namely, because it was being thus observed by Christian priests who, with their hands, touch and handle this new and immaculate sacrament of the most holy body of my son. For the Jews had, in the ancient law of the Old Testament, a shadow, a figure, of this sacrament. But Christians now have the truth itself, namely, him who is true God and man, in that blessed and consecrated bread. After those earlier Christian priests had observed these practices for a time, God himself, through the infusion of his Holy Spirit, put into the heart of the Pope then guiding the Church and other law more acceptable and pleasing to him in this matter, namely, by pouring this infusion into the heart of the Pope so that he established a statute in the universal church that Christian priests, who have so holy and so worthy an office, namely, of consecrating this precious sacrament, should by no means live in the easily contaminated, carnal delight of marriage. And therefore, through God's preordinance and his judgment, it has been justly ordained that priests who do not live in chastity and continence of the flesh are cursed and excommunicated before God and deserve to be deprived of their priestly office. But still, if they truthfully amend their lives with the true purpose of not sinning further, they will obtain mercy from God. Know this too, that if some pope concedes to priests a license to contract carnal marriage, God will condemn him to a sentence as great, in a spiritual way, as that which the law justly inflicts in a corporeal way on a man who has transgressed so gravely that he must have his eyes gouged out, his tongue and lips, nose and ears cut off, his hands and feet amputated, all his body's blood spilled out to grow completely cold, and finally, his whole bloodless corpse cast out to be devoured by dogs and other wild beasts. Similar things would truly happen in a spiritual way to that pope who were to go against the aforementioned preordinance, and will of God and concede to priests such a license to contract marriage. For that same Pope would be totally deprived by God of his spiritual sight and hearing, and of his spiritual words and deeds. All his spiritual wisdom would grow completely cold, and finally, after his death, his soul would be cast out to be tortured eternally in hell so that there it might become the food of demons everlastingly, 
and without end. Yes, even if St. Gregory the Pope had made this statute, in the aforesaid sentence he would never have obtained mercy from God if he had not humbly revoked his statute before his death. I am God, the Creator of all. I gave to angels and to humans free decisions so that those who willed to do my will might remain with me forever, and so that those who thought things contrary to me might be separated from me. And so, certain of the angels became demons because they did not will to love me or to obey me. Then when man had been created and the devil saw my love for man, the devil not only became my enemy but also promoted war against me by inciting Adam to violate my commandments. The devil prevailed on that occasion by my permission and as a result of my justice. And ever since that time, the devil and I are in discord and strife because I want man to live according to my will while the devil exerts himself to make man follow his own desires. Therefore at that moment when I opened heaven with my heart's blood, the devil was deprived of that justice which he seemed to have, and those souls that were worthy were saved and freed. Then indeed the law was established that it should be in man's decision to follow me, his God, in order to obtain the everlasting crown. But if he follows the devil's desires, he will have everlasting punishment. Thus the devil and I do struggle, in that we both desire souls as bridegrooms desire their brides. For I desire souls in order to give them eternal joy and honor, but the devil desires to give them eternal horror and sorrow. Hear what the queen had done to me. I allowed the raising of her to a kingship, etc. Addition. Christ speaks, write to her that she should make a clean confession of all that she had done from her youth, and that she should have a firm purpose of amendment according to the advice of her confessor. Second, she should diligently recall the manner and the quality of her life during her marriage and during her rule, for she is going to render an account of everything to me. Third, she must have the intention of paying her debts and of restoring that which she knows was wrongly acquired. For the soul is in peril as long as such things are kept, and it does no good to give lavish gifts if debts go unpaid. Fourth, she is not to burden the community with her new inventions, but instead should lighten the burdens which have grown customary. For God will hear the sigh and the crying of those in misery. Fifth, she must have counselors who are just and not covetous and she must entrust her judgments to such men as love truth and do not fawn upon factions or seek to grow rich, but know how to be content with what is necessary. Sixth, every day, at fixed times, she should remember God's wounds and his passion, for by this means the love of God is renewed in the heart. Seventh, at fixed times she should collect the poor, wash their feet, and refresh them. She should love all her subjects with sincere charity bringing all those that strive to accord and consoling those who are unjustly offended. Eighth, she should grant her gifts with discretion and according to her means, not oppressing some while making others rich, but wisely relieving some without burdening anyone. Ninth, she is not to be more attentive to the money of criminals than to justice. But setting aside all greed, she is to weigh the quality of the crimes and show more compassion where she sees greater humility. Tenth, during her lifetime, she is to apply all her diligence to ensure that her kingdom can be in a calm state after her death. For I predict to her that henceforth she will not have offspring from her womb. Eleventh, she should be content with the colors and beauty by which God has adorned her face. For extraneous color is very displeasing to God. Twelfth, she is to acquire greater humility and contrition for her sins because, in my eyes, she is a predator of many souls, a prodigal squanderer of my goods and a rod of tribulation to my friends. Thirteenth, she must have continual fear in her heart because in all the time she has had, she has led the life of a lascivious woman rather than that of a queen. Fourteenth, let her put aside worldly customs and those women who flatter her. The short time that she has left, she should spend in honoring me, for up to now she has treated me as if I were a human being without recollection of her sins. Let her now fear and live in such a way that she may not feel my judgment. Otherwise, if she does not listen to me, I will judge her not as a queen but as an ungrateful apostate, and I will scourge her from head to heel, and she will be a disgrace before me and my angels and my saints. Item, a revelation. Christ speaks, write those things with fewer and gentler words, just as the Holy Spirit will inflame you, and send them through my bishop to the queen. Item, concerning a certain queen. 
A lady was seen standing in a shift spattered with sperm and mud. And a voice was heard, This woman is a monkey that sniffs at its own stinking posterior. She has poison in her heart, and she is harmful to herself, and she hastens into snares that throw her down. And again she was seen wearing a crown of twigs spattered with human excrement, and with mud from the streets, and sitting naked on a tottering beam. At once there appeared a most beautiful virgin who said, This is that insolent and audacious woman who is reputed by mankind to be a lady of the world, but in God's eyes she has been cast off, as you see. And the virgin added, O woman, think of your entrance and be attentive to your end, and open the eyes of your heart, and see that your counselors are those who hate your soul. Item, concerning a certain queen. A woman was seen sitting on a golden seat, and two Ethiopians stood before her, one, as it were, on the right and the other on the left. The one standing on the right called out, and said, O lion-like woman, I bring blood. Take and pour out. For it is a mark of the lioness to thirst after blood. The one on the left said, O woman, I bring to you fire and a vessel. Take, for you are of a fiery nature, and pour out into the waters in order that your memory may last in the waters as well as on the land. Then a virgin of wondrous beauty appeared, and the Ethiopians fled from her sight. She said, This woman is in a perilous state. If she prospers in accordance with her will, the result will be tribulation for many. But if she suffers tribulation, the result will be more useful to her for obtaining eternal life. She herself does not wish to give up her own will or to suffer tribulation in compliance with God. Therefore, if she is left to her own will, she will not be the cause of consolation for herself or for others. Item, a revelation. The son appeared and said, This woman had done some things that did please me. Therefore, because of the prayers of my friends, I am willing to point out to her how she may escape the scorn of mankind and the squandering of her own soul if, indeed, she obeys well. If not, she would not escape the justice of the judge, for she did not will to hear the Father's voice. Concerning Lord Gomez, the mother of God speaks, advise him to do justice wherever he can. If he knows that he has goods that were wrongly acquired, he must not delay in making restitution. He must also be careful not to impose unusual burdens on his subjects, and he must be content with the things that he has because they are sufficient for him if he manages them discreetly and with moderation. Women other than his own wife, he must avoid like poison, and he must not lead out the army against anyone nor take part in the action himself unless he fully knows that justice is on his side and that the war is just. He must also be zealous in making frequent use of confession and in receiving the body of Christ more frequently, and in occupying himself, at fixed times in the day, with the remembrance of Christ's passion and his wounds. Concerning Anthony of Carlito. Christ speaks, tell the queen to let him stay in his position. If he rises up to greater things, it will be at the cost of his soul, and neither he himself nor his friends will have any joy out of his promotion. And so it all turned out. Christ speaks to his bride and says, tell him that if he wishes to be called a bishop in the justice of the divine judgment, he must not imitate me manners and customs of many who are now rulers of the church. I took on a human body from a virgin in order that by words and deeds I might fulfill the law which, from eternity, had been ordained in the Godhead. I opened the gate of heaven with my heart's blood, and I so illumined the way by my words and deeds that all might use my example in order to merit eternal life. But truly, the words that I said and the deeds that I did in the world are now almost completely forgotten and neglected. For this, no one is as much a cause as the prelates of the churches. They are full of pride, greed, and the rottenness of bodily pleasure. All of these things are contrary to my commandments and to Holy Church's honorable statutes, which my friends established out of great devotion after my ascension and after I had accomplished my will in the world. For those wicked prelates of the churches, who are filled with the malignity of an evil spirit, have left to mankind examples that are exceedingly harmful to souls, and therefore it is necessary for me to exact full justice from them by doing judgment on them, abolishing them from the book of life in heaven and placing them beside my enemy Lucifer in hell. In hellish seas that shall be the seat of their perpetual excruciation. Nevertheless, you ought to know that if anyone is willing to amend himself before death by loving me with all his heart, 
and if he abstains from sins, then I will be prompt in showing my mercy. Tell him also, as if on your own part, these words that follow. My Lord, it sometimes happens that, from a black furnace, there goes forth a beautiful flame that is useful and quite necessary for fashioning works of beauty. But that does not mean that the furnace must then be praised for its black color. The praise and honor and thanks are owed to the artist and master of those works. It is a similar situation with me, unworthy woman that I am, if you find something useful in my advice. For then you ought continually to show infinite thanks and willing service, not to me, but to God himself, who made and makes all things and who has a perfect will to do good. My Lord, I begin by first speaking to you of those things that touch the salvation of many souls. I advise you that, if you would have God's friendship, either you, nor any other bishop acting on your behalf, should be willing to promote anyone to sacred orders unless he has first been diligently examined by good clerics and has been found to be so suitable in his life and character that, by the testimony of wise and truthful men, he is declared worthy to receive such an office. With diligent attention, see to it that all the bishops under you and all the suffragans of your archbishopric do the same. For no one could believe how great God's indignation is against those bishops who do not take care to know and diligently to examine the quality of those whom they promote to orders of such dignity in their bishoprics. Whether they do this at the supplication of others or out of negligence and laziness or because of fear, they shall indeed render a most strict account of this at God's judgment. I also advise you to inquire about the number and the identities of those holders of benefices in your diocese who have the care of souls. Summon them to your presence at least once a year to discuss then with them their own welfare and that of the souls of those under them. And if, by chance, they could not all come together on the same day, then definite dates are to be set on which they may come to you individually during the year so that none of them may be able to excuse himself in any way from consulting you for a whole year. And you are to preach to them about the kind of life to be led by those who have an office of such great dignity. Know too that priests who have concubines and celebrate Mass are as acceptable and pleasing to God as were the inhabitants of Sodom whom God submersed in hell. And even though the Mass, in itself, always is the same and has the same power and efficacy, nevertheless the kiss of peace that such fornicating priests give in the Mass is as pleasing to God as the kiss by which Judas handed over the Savior of all. Therefore constantly try as much as possible, with words and deeds, by enticing or rebuking or threatening, to work together with them so that they may endeavor to lead a chaste life, especially since they must touch so very holy a sacrament, and, with their hands, administer it to other faithful Christians. Furthermore, for their salvation you should advise all the clergy, both the higher ranks made up of prelates or canons and also the minor clerics, all, that is, who are subject to your rule and have ecclesiastical incomes, that they should correct their lives in every respect. And let no one believe that, for the sake of avoiding sodomy, fornication is at all permissible for clerics, nor, for that reason, is it to be endured that they should defile themselves with women. For every Christian who has the use of intellect, and who does not care about eternal life while he is living, will undoubtedly endure after death the most severe punishments of hell for eternity. I also advise you that your household should not be too large out of pride, but that it should be well proportioned to the needs of your office as a ruler and to the requirements of your status. Those clerics, therefore, who are called your companions, you should keep with you wherever you may be, for the good of your reputation rather than for vainglory or for pomp, and they are to be few in number rather than many. But of those clerics whom you maintain for no other reason than to sing the divine office or to pursue studies or to teach others or to do writing, you may have as many as you please. And nevertheless it is to your advantage to take diligent care, as best you can, for their correction and for the salvation of their souls. Be attentive to the rest of your servants so that each has his own task. And if some of them are superfluous, do not keep them out of vainglory lest your heart be elated at having a larger household than your peers. It is also expedient that you always have in mind those truly necessary members of your household whom you keep with you, painstakingly scrutinize their lives like a true householder, correcting their actions, lives, and characters and, with good formation, encouraging and admonishing them in a fatherly way so that they learn to flee from sins and vices and to love God above all things. 
It is indeed more acceptable to God and more useful to yourself that you keep with you no member of the household who is unwilling to comply with sound advice and humbly amend his transgressions. Of your clothing, I advise you never to have in your possession more than three pairs at one time. Everything beyond this, you should immediately give to God himself. Of bed covers, towels, and tablecloths, keep for yourself only what is necessary and useful to you, and give the rest to God. Of silver vessels, reserve for yourself just enough for your own person and for the guests who eat at your own table. Donate the superfluous pieces to God with a cheerful mind. For the rest of your household and the guests who sit at other tables certainly can, without any embarrassment, eat and drink using vessels of tin, clay, wood, or glass. For that custom which now prevails in the houses of bishops and lords of having an overly excessive abundance of gold and silver is quite harmful to souls and very repulsive to God himself, who, for our sake, subjected himself to all poverty. Beware, also, of having too many courses and extravagant delicacies. Nor should you have overly large and expensive horses, but rather those that are moderate in size and price. For such large horses are needed by those who expose themselves to the dangers of war for the defense of justice and the protection of life and not for pride. Indeed, I tell you that as often as prelates, out of pride and vainglory, mount big horses, the devil mounts the prelates' necks. For I know a person who, when the prelates and cardinals proudly lifted their feet to ride on the backs of their big horses, saw demons as Ethiopians who then lifted their feet and mounted the necks of the prelates, and sat there laughing. As often as the prelates pompously spurred their horses, the Ethiopians lifted their heads in their glee and kicked their heels into the breasts of those horsemen. Again, I advise you to have your vicar's promise under oath that, while carrying out your business, they will not presume to do anything contrary to justice. And if they later do the opposite, you are to have them rebuked in accordance with justice. If you do as I have said, you can be confident that your conscience is quite sound. And now I give advice for the consolation of the souls of your departed, about whom you asked me whether or not they were in purgatory, and what alms deeds ought to be done for them, etc. I answer and say that every day for one year you are to have two masses celebrated for them, and every day you are to feed two paupers, and every week take care to distribute one florin in coins to the poor. Say also to the parish priests that they are to correct their parishioners and to rebuke them for their open sins and cases that pertain to them in order that they may be able to live better lives. Those parishioners who are unwilling to be rebuked should then be rebuked by you. If, however, you know that some are openly sinning against God and justice, and if they are such great tyrants that you cannot pass judgment on them, then tell them in sweet and gentle words to correct themselves. If they do not wish to obey, you may leave them to God's judgment, and God will see that your intention is good. One must not throw the meek lamb into a wolf's ferocious teeth because this will make the wolf more ravenous. Nevertheless, it is fitting for you to forewarn them charitably about the peril of their souls, as a father does with his children when they oppose him. Nor are you bound to forego rebukes out of fear for your body unless, by chance, some danger to souls could come from them. The Virgin Mary speaks to Lady Bridget and says, I want to tell you what I did for the soul of your son Charles when it was being separated from his body. I acted like a woman standing by another woman who is giving birth, in order that she might help the infant, lest it die in the flow of blood or suffocate in that narrow place through which an infant exits, and so that, by her watchful care, the infant's enemies, who are in the same house, might not be able to kill it. I acted in the same way. Indeed I stood near your same son Charles, shortly before he sent forth his spirit, in order that he might not have such thoughts of carnal love in his memory that, for the sake of this love, he would think or say anything against God or will to omit anything pleasing to God or will to perform, to his soul's harm, those things that could be in any way contrary to the divine will. I also helped him in that narrow space, at his soul's exit from his body so that in dying he would not endure pain so hard as to cause him to become at all inconstant through despair, and so that in dying he might not forget God. I also guarded his soul from its deadly enemies, the demons, so that none of them could touch it. As soon as it had left his body, I took custody of it and defended it. This action quickly routed and dispersed that whole throng of demons who, in their malice, yearned to swallow it and torture it for eternity. But as to how, 
After the death of Charles, judgment was passed on his soul. This will be shown to you completely when it pleases me. After an interval of some days, the same Virgin Mary herself again appeared to the same Lady Bridget, who was wide awake and at prayer and said, Through God's goodness, it is now permitted for you to see and hear how judgment was passed on the aforesaid soul when it had left the body. That which then happened in one moment before God's incomprehensible majesty will be shown to you in painstaking detail at intervals by means of corporeal likenesses so that your understanding may be able to grasp it. In the same hour, therefore, Lady Bridget saw herself caught up to a certain large and beautiful palace where, upon the tribunal, the Lord Jesus Christ sat as if crowned as an emperor in the company of an infinite host of attendant angels and saints. She saw standing near him his most worthy mother, who listened carefully to the judgment. Also in the presence of the judge, a soul was seen standing in great fear and panic, naked as a newborn infant, and, as it were, entirely blind so that it could see nothing, but in its consciousness, it understood what was being said and done in the palace. An angel stood on the judge's right side near the soul and a devil on his left. But neither of them touched the soul or handled it. Then, at last, the devil cried out and said, Hearken, O most almighty judge! I complain in your sight about a woman who is both my lady and your mother, and whom you love so much that you have given to her power over heaven and earth, and over all of us demons of hell. She has indeed done me an injustice regarding that soul which now stands here. According to justice, as soon as this soul had left the body, I ought to have taken it to myself and presented it in my company before your court of judgment. And behold, O just judge, that woman, your mother, seized this soul with her own hands, almost before it exited from the man's mouth, and in her powerful ward she has brought it to your judgment. Then Mary, the virgin mother of God, answered thus, Hearken, you devil, to my reply. When you were created, you understood the justice that was in God from eternity and without beginning. You also had free choice to do what most pleased you. And even though you have chosen to hate God rather than love Him, nevertheless you still understand quite well what, according to justice, ought to be done. I tell you, therefore, that it was my business, rather than yours, to present that soul before God, the true judge. For while this soul was in the body it had a great love for me, and in its heart frequently pondered the fact that God had deigned to make me his mother, and that he willed to exalt me on high above all created things. As a result he began to love God with such great charity that in his heart he used to say this, I so rejoice because God holds the Virgin Mary his mother most dear above all things, that there is in the world no creature and no bodily delight that I would take in exchange for that joy. No, I would prefer that joy to all earthly delights. And if it were possible that God could remove her, in the smallest point, from that dignity in which she stands, I would rather choose for myself, in exchange, eternal torture in the depth of hell. Therefore, to God himself be endless thanksgiving and everlasting glory for that blessed grace and that glory immeasurable that he has given to his most worthy mother. Therefore, O devil, see now with what sort of will he passed away, which now seems to you more just, that his soul come to God's judgment defended by me, or that it come into your hands to be tortured without pity? The devil answered, I have no right to expect that this soul, which loves you more than itself, would come into my hands before judgment be passed. But even though, at the bidding of justice, you did him this favor before the judgment, nevertheless, after the judgment his works will condemn him to be punished at my hands. Now, O Queen, I ask you why you drove all of us demons from the presence of his body at his soul's exit so that none of us could cause any horror there or strike any fear into him. The Virgin Mary answered, I did this in return for the ardent charity that he had toward my body and in return for the joy that he had from the fact that I am the mother of God. Therefore I obtained from my son the favor that, wherever he was and even where he now is, no evil spirit might approach his body. After this, the devil speaks to the judge and says, I know that you are justice and power itself. You do not judge less justly for the devil than for an angel. Therefore adjudge that soul to me. Using the wisdom that I had when you created me, I had written all his sins. Indeed, I had kept watch over all his sins with that malice of mine that I had when I fell from heaven. For when that soul first came to the age of reason and really understood that what it was doing was sinful, 
its own will then drew it to live in worldly pride and carnal pleasure, rather than resist such things. The angel answered, When his mother first understood that his will was wavering towards sin, she immediately rushed to his aid with works of mercy and daily prayers that God might deign to have mercy on him lest he withdraw himself from him. Because of those works of his mother, he finally obtained a godly fear so that, as often as he fell into sin, he immediately hurried to make his confession. The devil answered, I must tell his sins. And at the very moment he intended to begin, he immediately started to exclaim and lament and carefully search himself, including his head and all the limbs that he seemed to have. And he was seen to tremble all over, and with great confusion he cried out, Woe to me in my misery! How have I wasted my long labor? Not only is the text blotted out and ruined, but even the material on which everything was written has burned up completely. Moreover, the material indicates the times that he sinned. And I do not recall the times any more than the sins written down in connection with them. The angel answered, This was done by his mother's tears and long labors and many prayers. God sympathized with her sighs and gave to her son this grace, namely, that for every sin he committed, he obtained contrition, making a humble confession out of love for God. Therefore those sins have been blotted out and are unheeded by your memory. The devil answered, asserting that he still had a sack full of those writings according to which the above said knight had purposed to make amends for his sins but did not take care to do so and asserting that the writings gave grounds on which to torture him until, through punishment, satisfaction had been made. And indeed that same knight had not yet taken care to amend those sins during his lifetime. The angel answered, Open the sack and seek a judgment on those sins for which you must chastise him. At those words, the devil cried out like a madman, saying, I have been plundered in my power. Not only my sack has been taken, but also the sins that filled it. The sack in which I put all the reasons that I had to punish him was his laziness. For, because of his laziness, he omitted many good things. The angel answered, His mother's tears have plundered you and have burst the sack and have destroyed the writing. So greatly did her tears please God. The devil answered, I still have here a few things to bring forth, namely, his venial sins. The angel answered, He had the intention to make a pilgrimage from his fatherland, leaving his goods and his friends and visiting, by many labors, the holy places. He complimented these things, furthermore, by so preparing himself that he was worthy to gain an indulgence from holy church. Moreover, he desired, by making amends for his sins, to appease God his Creator. As a result, all those charges, which you just said that you had written down, have been pardoned. The devil answered, Nevertheless, I still must punish him for all those venial sins that he committed, and therefore, through indulgences, they have not been deleted at all. For there are thousands upon thousands of them, and they have all been written on my tongue. The angel answered, Extend your tongue and show the writing. The devil answered with loud howling and clamor like a maniac, and he said, Woe is me! I have not one word to say, for my tongue has been cut off at the root together with its strength. The angel answered, His mother did this with her continual prayers and her labor, for she loved his soul with her whole heart. Therefore, for the sake of her love, it pleased God to pardon all the venial sins that he committed from his infancy right up to his death, and therefore your tongue is said to have lost its strength. The devil answered, I still have one thing carefully stored in my heart, and no one can abolish it. This thing is the fact that he acquired some things unjustly and never attended to their restoration. The angel answered, His mother made satisfaction for such things with her alms, her prayers, and her works of mercy so that the rigor of justice inclined toward the mildness of mercy, and God gave him the perfect intention of making full satisfaction, according to his opportunities and without sparing any of his own goods, to all those from whom he had taken anything unjustly. God accepted that intention in place of its effect because he was not well enough to live any longer. Therefore, his heirs must make satisfaction for such things to the extent that they can. The devil answered, If I therefore do not have the power to punish him for sins, I must nevertheless chastise him because he did not practice good deeds and virtues according to his ability, while he had his full senses and a healthy body. 
For virtues and good deeds are those treasures that he ought to bring with him to such a kingdom, namely, to the glorious kingdom of God. Permit me therefore, by means of punishment, to supply what he lacks in virtuous deeds. The angel answered, It is written that to one who asks, it shall be given, and to one who knocks with perseverance, it shall be opened. Listen then, you devil. By her charitable prayers and pious works his mother has perseveringly knocked at the gate of mercy on his behalf. And for more than thirty years, she has shed many thousands of tears that God might deign to pour the holy into his heart so that this same son of hers might willingly offer his goods, his body, and his soul to God's service. And God did so, for that night became so fervent that it pleased him to live for nothing other than to follow God's will. And behold, God, who had been petitioned for so long a time, did pour his blessed spirit into his heart. And the Virgin Mother of God has given to him, out of her own virtue whatever he lacks in those spiritual weapons and garments that are proper for knights who must, in the kingdom of heaven, enter the presence of the highest emperor. Those saints too who now have a place in the heavenly kingdom, and whom this knight loved during his life in the world, added to his consolation out of their merits. For he himself truly did assemble a treasure, as those pilgrims do who daily exchange perishable goods for eternal riches. And because he did so, he will therefore obtain everlasting joy and honor, especially for his burning desire to make a pilgrimage to the holy city of Jerusalem, and for the fact that he fervently longed to risk his life willingly in warfare so that if he had been a match for so great a work, the holy land might be restored to the dominion of Christians to the end that the glorious sepulchre of God might be held in due reverence. Therefore you, O devil, have no right to supply those things that he did not personally accomplish. The devil answered, Still, he lacks a crown. For if I could devise anything to spoil its perfection, I would willingly do so. The angel answered, It is entirely certain that all who will themselves from hell by truly repenting their sins, by voluntarily conforming themselves to the divine will, and by loving God himself with all their heart, will obtain his grace. And it pleases God himself to give them a crown out of the triumphal crown of his blessed human body if they have been purged according to strict justice. Therefore, it is not at all suitable for you, O devil, to devise anything related to his crown. When the devil heard this, he cried out impatiently, roaring, and said, Woe is me! For all my memory has been taken from me. I do not now recall in what respect that night followed my will. And what is more amazing, I have even forgotten what name he was called by while he lived. The angel answered, Know that now, in heaven, he is called Son of Tears. The devil cried out loudly and answered, Oh, what a curse so his mother, that she pig, is, who had a belly so expansive that so much water poured into her that her belly's every space was filled with liquid for tears. Cursed be she by me and by all my company. The angel answered, Your curse is God's honor and the blessing of all his friends. Then, however, Christ the judge spoke, saying this, Depart, O devil, my enemy. Then he said to the knight, Come, O my chosen one. And so, at once, the devil fled. When the bride saw these things, she said, O power eternal and incomprehensible, you yourself, God and Lord, Jesus Christ. You pour into hearts all good thoughts and prayers and tears. You conceal your gracious gifts, and for them you confer eternal rewards and glory. Therefore, to you be honor and service and thanks for all that you have created. O my sweetest God, you are most dear to me and truly to me dearer than my body and soul. The angel also then spoke to that same bride of Christ and said, You ought to know that this vision has been shown to you by God not only for your own consolation but also in order that God's friends may be able to understand how much he deigns to do in answer to the prayers, tears, and labors of his friends who charitably pray and labor for others with perseverance and goodwill. You also ought to know that this night, your son, would not have had such a grace if he had not, since infancy had the will to love God and his friends and to amend his life willingly after every fall into sin. The son spoke to the bride, When you people entered my temple, which was dedicated with my blood, you were as cleansed of all your sins as if you had at that moment been lifted from the font of baptism. And because of your labors and devotion, some souls of your relatives that were in purgatory have this day been liberated and have entered into heaven in my glory. 
for all who come to this place with a perfect will to amend their lives in accord with their better conscience, and who are not willing to fall back into their former sins, will have all their former sins completely forgiven, and they will have an increase of grace to make progress. While I was at Mount Calvary, most mournfully weeping, I saw that my Lord, who was naked and scourged, had been led by the Jews to his crucifixion. He was being guarded by them diligently. I then saw too that a certain hole had been cut into the mount, and that the crucifiers were round about, and ready to work their cruelty. The Lord, however, turned toward me and said to me, Be attentive, for in this hole in the rock the foot of the cross was fixed at the time of my passion. And at once I saw how the Jews were there fixing and fastening his cross firmly in the hole in the rock of the mount with bits of wood strongly hammered in on every side in order that the cross might stand more solidly, and not fall. Then. When the cross had been so solidly fastened there, at once wooden planks were fitted around the trunk of the cross to form steps up to the place where his feet were to be crucified, in order that both he and his crucifiers might be able to ascend by those plank steps and stand atop the planks in a way more convenient for crucifying him. After this, they then ascended by those steps, leaving him with the greatest of mockery and scolding. He ascended gladly, like a meek lamb led to the slaughter. When he was finally on top of those planks, he at once, willingly and without coercion, extended his arm and opened his right hand and placed it on the cross. Those savage torturers monstrously crucified it, piercing it with a nail through that part where the bone was more solid. And then, with a rope, they pulled violently on his left hand and fastened it to the cross in the same manner. Finally, they extended his body on the cross beyond all measure, and placing one of his shins on top of the other, they fastened to the cross his feet, thus joined, with two nails. And they violently extended those glorious limbs so far on the cross that nearly all of his veins and sinews were bursting. Then the crown of thorns, which they had removed from his head when he was being crucified, they now put back, fitting it onto his most holy head. It pricked his awesome head with such force that then, and there his eyes were filled with flowing blood and his ears were obstructed and his face and beard were covered as if they had been dipped in that rose-red blood. And at once those crucifiers and soldiers quickly removed all the planks that abutted the cross, and then the cross remained alone and lofty, and my Lord was crucified upon it. And as I, filled with sorrow, gazed at their cruelty, I then saw his most mournful mother lying on the earth, as if trembling and half-dead. She was being consoled by John and by those others, her sisters, who were then standing not far from the cross on its right side. Then the new sorrow of the compassion of that most holy mother so transfixed me that I felt, as it were, that a sharp sword of unbearable bitterness was piercing my heart. Then at last his sorrowful mother arose, and, as it were, in a state of physical exhaustion, she looked at her son. Thus, supported by her sisters, she stood there all dazed and in suspense, as though dead yet living, transfixed by the sword of sorrow. When her son saw her and his other friends weeping, with a tearful voice he commended her to John. It was quite discernible in his bearing and voice that out of compassion for his mother, his own heart was being penetrated by a most sharp arrow of sorrow beyond all measure. Then too his fine and lovely eyes appeared half dead, his mouth was open and bloody, his face was pale and sunken, all livid and stained with blood and his whole body was as if black and blue and pale and very weak from the constant downward flow of blood. Indeed, his skin and the virginal flesh of his most holy body were so delicate and tender that, after the infliction of a slight blow, a black and blue mark appeared on the surface. At times, however, he tried to make stretching motions on the cross because of the exceeding bitterness of the intense and most acute pain that he felt. For at times the pain from his pierced limbs and veins ascended to his heart, and battered him cruelly with an intense martyrdom, and thus his death was prolonged and delayed amidst grave torment and great bitterness. Then, therefore, in distress from the exceeding anguish of his pain and already near to death, he cried to the Father in a loud and tearful voice, saying, O Father, why have you forsaken me? He then had pale lips, a bloody tongue, and a sunken abdomen that adhered to his back as if he had no viscera within. A second time also, he cried out again in the greatest of pain and anxiety, O Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Then his head, raising itself a little, immediately bowed, 
and thus he sent forth his spirit. When his mother then saw these things, she trembled at that immense bitterness, and would have fallen onto the earth if she had not been supported by the other women. Then, in that hour, his hands retracted slightly from the place of the nail holes because of the exceeding weight of his body, and thus his body was as if supported by the nails with which his feet had been crucified. Moreover, his fingers and hands and arms were now more extended than before, his shoulder blades, in fact, and his back were as if pressed tightly to the cross. Then at last the Jews standing around cried out in mockery against his mother, saying many things. For some said, Mary, now your son is dead, but others said other mocking words. And while the crowds were thus standing about, one man came running with the greatest of fury and fixed the lance in his right side with such violence and force that the lance would have passed almost through the other side of the body. Thus, when the lance was extracted from the body, at once a stream, as it were, of blood spurted out of that wound in abundance. In fact, the iron blade of the lance and a part of the shaft came out of the body red and stained with the blood. Seeing these things, his mother so violently trembled with bitter sighing that it was quite discernible in her face and bearing that her soul was then being penetrated by the sharp sword of sorrow. When all these things had been accomplished, and when the large crowds were receding, certain of the Lord's friends took him down. Then, with pity, his mother received him into her most holy arms, and sitting, she laid him on her knee, all torn as he was and wounded and black and blue. With tears, she and John and those others, the weeping women, washed him. And then, with her linen cloth, his most mournful mother wiped his whole body and its wounds. And she closed his eyes and kissed them, and she wrapped him in a clean cloth of fine linen. And thus they escorted him with lamentation and very great sorrow and placed him in the sepulchre. After this, in that same hour, Christ spoke to his same bride, Lady Bridget, saying, To these things that you have now seen and to the other things that I endured, the world's princes are not attentive, nor do they consider the places in which I was born and I suffered. For they are like a man who has a place designated for wild and untamed beasts, and where he sets loose his hunting dogs and takes delight in gazing at the dogs and the wild things as they run. It is a similar case with the princes of the earth, and the prelates of the churches and all states of the world. They gaze at earthly delights with greater eagerness and pleasure than at my death and my passion and my wounds. Therefore I shall now send them my words through you, and if they do not change their hearts and turn them toward me, they will be condemned along with those who divided my clothing and, over my garment, cast lots. Addition. Here follows a revelation made to bless Bridget and Famagusta. The sun speaks, this city is Gamara, burning with the fire of lust and of superfluity, and of ambition. Therefore its structures shall fall, and it shall be desolated and diminished, and its inhabitants shall depart, and they shall groan in sorrow and tribulation, and they shall die out, and their shame shall be mentioned in many lands because I am angered at them. Concerning the Duke, who was privy to his brother's death, Christ speaks, this man boldly expands his pride. He boasts of his incontinence, and is not attentive to the things that he has done to his neighbor. Therefore, if he does not humble himself, I will act in accord with the common proverb, No lighter wails he who afterward weeps than he who wailed afore. For he shall have a death no lighter than his brother's, no, a death more bitter, unless he quickly amends himself. Concerning the Duke's confessor, Christ speaks, What did that friar say to you? Did he not say that the Duke is good and cannot live in a better way? Did he not excuse the Duke's incontinence? Such men are not confessors but deceivers. They go about like simple sheep, but they are more truly foxes and flatterers. Such are those friends who see and propose assumptions and dejections to human beings for the sake of some temporal trifle. Therefore if that friar had sat in his convent, he would have obtained less punishment and a greater crown. Now, however, he will not escape the hand of one who rebukes and afflicts. Certain people advise the lady to change clothes and blacken faces because of the Saracens. Christ speaks, what advice are they giving you? Is it not to disguise your clothes and blacken your faces? Would I, God, who instruct you, truly be like someone who does no know the future or like someone powerless who fears all things? Not in the least. But I am wisdom itself and power itself, and I foreknow all and can do all. 
Therefore retain your accustomed manner of clothing and faces, and entrust your wills to me. For I, who saved Sarah from the hands of her captors, will also save all of you on land and sea and will provide for you in a way that is to your advantage. Concerning a bishop, the mother speaks, My friend ought to love you as a mother, as a lady, as a daughter, and as a sister. As a mother, because of your age and because of the advice that he must seek. Second, as a lady, because of the grace given to you by God, who through you has shown the secrets of his wisdom. Third, as a daughter, by teaching and by consoling and by providing you with more useful things. Fourth, as a sister, by reproving, when this would be opportune, and by admonishing and by inciting to more perfect things through words and examples. Also, tell him that he ought to be like one who carries the best of flowers. These flowers are my words, which are sweeter than honey to those who savor them, sharper and more penetrating than arrows, and more effective in remuneration. It is therefore the duty of the bearer to protect the flowers from the wind, the rain, and the heat, namely, from the wind of worldly talk, from the rain of carnal delights, from the heat of worldly favor. For one who glories in such things causes the flowers to become worthless, and shows himself unsuitable to carry them. Concerning the Queen of Cyprus The sun speaks, Advise the queen not to return to her native land for this is not to her advantage. But let her stay in the place in which she has been set, serving God with all her heart. Second, she is not to marry, taking a second husband, for it is more acceptable to God to weep for the things that have been done and by penance, to make up for time that has been uselessly spent. Third, she should guide the people of her kingdom toward mutual concord and charity. And she should labor that justice and good morals be laudably maintained and that the community not be weighed down with unusual burdens. Fourth, for God's sake, she should forget the evils that were committed against her husband and not burn for revenge. For I am the judge, and I shall judge for her. Fifth, she should nurture her son with divine charity and appoint as his counselors men who are just and not covetous, and as members of his household, men who are modest, composed, and wise from whom he may learn to fear God, to rule justly, to sympathize with the unfortunate, to flee from flatterers and sycophants like poison, and to seek the advice of just men, even if they are poor, lowly, or despised. Sixth, she is to put down the shameful custom of women involving tight clothing, display of the breasts, unguents, and many other vanities, for these are things entirely hateful to God. Seventh, she should have a confessor who, having left the world, loves souls more than gifts, and who either glosses over sins nor fears to reprove them. And, in those things that pertain to the salvation of the soul, she is to obey him just as she obeys God. Eighth, she should seek out and be attentive to the lives of holy queens and saintly women, and she is to labor for the increase of God's honor. Ninth, she should be reasonable in her gifts, avoiding both debts and the praises of men, for it is more acceptable to God to give little or even nothing than to contract debts and to defraud one's neighbor. On the crowning of the new king, the son speaks, It is a great burden to be a king, but also a great honor and a very great enjoyment. It is fitting, therefore, that a king be mature, experienced, prudent, just, and a hard worker who loves his neighbor's welfare more than his own will. Therefore, in ancient times kingdoms were well ruled when such a man was elected as king, one who had the will and the knowledge and the ability to rule with justice. Now kingdoms are not kingdoms but scenes of childishness, folly, and brigandage. For just as the brigand searches for ways and times to lay his ambush in order to acquire lucre without being marked, so kings now search for inventions by which to elevate their offspring, fill their purses with money, and discreetly burden their subjects. And they all the more gladly do justice in order to obtain temporal good, but they do not love justice in order to obtain everlasting reward. Therefore, a wise man wisely said, Woe to that kingdom whose king is a child who lives daintily and has dainty flatterers but feels no anguish at all about the advancement of the community. But because this boy will not bear his father's iniquity, therefore, if he wishes to make progress and to fulfill the dignity of his kingly name, let him obey my words that I have already spoken concerning Cyprus. And let him not imitate the behavior of his predecessors, but let him lay aside childish levity and lead a kingly life, 
having assistance of the sort who fear and who do not love his gifts more than his soul and his honor, who hate flatteries, and who are not afraid to speak the truth and to follow it and to assert it. Otherwise, the boy will have no joy in his people, and his people no joy in the one elected. Prayer for the Intercession of St. Bridget of Sweden St. Bridget, Bride of Christ, your life was centered around honoring the wounds of Jesus. Intercede before our wounded Lord and ask him to forgive us for the times when we failed to recognize his presence, or accept his help and the times when we sinned against him, causing increased pain. St. Bridget, implore Jesus in his mercy to bestow upon us a reverence and devotion to his sacred wounds. Help us to carry our crosses with love. Please tell Jesus that we love him and thank him for the pain and humiliation he endured for our sake. St. Bridget, we humbly ask you to lay our petitions at the feet of the risen Jesus where we know you will be warmly received. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Saint Bridget of Sweden, pray for us.